Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Yi Chui. I'm a professor of uh, material science engineering and energy science engineering at Stanford University. I'm also uh, serving as the director of Prico Institute for Energy. So this session is very exciting. Everybody care about batteries. Let's talk about the real stuff, tangible, everyday life you have been using. Um, given the big background of a carbon neutral transformation, we get to net zero globally by 2050, 2060, 2070, depending on which country you are in. The timeline is very short. If you look at where the carbon come from, and one big sector is transportation. The next big sector, equally, almost the same, is electrical power, electricity sector. These two sectors adding together is about 60% of the carbon emission. So decarbonize these two sectors becomes so, so important. And in order to decarbonize these two sectors, so what are the technology really needed? No surprise. For the transportation sector, it's already growing really big in the past decade. That's electrical transportation. The global transportation, the ground transportation is, uh, has roughly about 1.4 billion car, trucks, buses running. And to decarbonize this 1.4 billion vehicles, we need roughly about 100 terawatt hour or batteries to power this 1.4 billion vehicles. What's 100 terawatt hour? Let me calibrate everybody. Through the 30 years of lithium ion production, 30 years already, with the current production plus the plan already committed production, all adding together, building 30 years, it's only one terawatt hour. So this 100 terawatt hour will take 100 years to, to build. Can we do that, deliver that within 30 years? That's num number one question. Now you look at electricity sector, integrating solar and wind, renewable electricity into the grid. Look at the world electricity consumption. If you want to store the electricity for about 72 hours, use batteries for doing that, it roughly takes 200 terawatt hour. It takes 200 years to produce. Adding together is 300, right? Transportation, electricity sector, 300 terawatt hour. So this is the challenge as well as the opportunity we are facing. The total market adding together conservative estimation is a $30 trillion market. Every year market is about $3 trillion. So this is a big problem, big challenge right here for the FII. Battery got to be a very important topic we need to discuss. Today we have two experts from industry to be the panelists to discuss about this opportunity. On the, my right hand side right here is a random uh, Bhattacharya, uh, Bhattacharya, he is the managing director of uh, SLB Ventures, doing a lot of energy investment. To the left right here is the chief revenue officer of Enervanil of a grid scale energy storage companies. Uh, let me start in, uh, by asking each one of them to uh, do a, about three, four minutes of introduction uh, what you have been working on to give our audience the background. Maybe we'll start from Arindam. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, E. I think you posed the challenge uh, really well, the 300 terawatt hour, and hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in detail in the next half an hour. So first of all, um, uh, for, for the audience, uh, I had uh, new venture investments for SLB Ventures, and uh, those of you who are, don't know SLB, SLB is now the new name of Schlumberger, uh, since the last 24 hours, we have just repositioned, rebranded ourselves, uh, taking our technology and innovation expertise from oil and gas across the total energy mix into new energy as well. 
So on the new energy side, uh, which is a big part of our future portfolio, where majority of our investment is taking place today, uh, energy storage and energy carriers actually sits very centrally in that. So we're investing uh, in the area of uh, hydrogen as energy carrier into the battery critical mineral supply chain, which has a big part to play in, in the, this problem or this challenge that we talk about, and also into uh, battery energy storage. And in battery energy storage, a, a lot of our focus area today in terms of investment is actually in the area of stationary energy storage. So when we look at it today, um, you know, when we look at uh, looking at investment criteria or focus, we're very uh, aware of these challenges posed by the 300 terawatt hour capacity required and the challenges that exist today in terms of safety of current battery systems, reliability, talking about versatility requirements that are going to come as you have higher renewable penetrations, uh, talking about supply chain challenges related to the upstream metals and minerals that are critical for the industry. Uh, so essentially looking forward, we have to start finding solutions for all of these. And uh, this sits really central uh, to our investment criteria. We look at a lot of alternative uh, electrochemistries uh, outside of lithium ion, especially when it comes to the stationary energy storage market. Uh, we are actually investors in Enervenue, so Randy will talk a lot more about Enervenue as well. Uh, we have other investments in the space as well. Uh, the energy storage space is quite nuanced when you start talking about time scale of storage requirements, going from short duration high power applications to long duration applications in places with very high renewable penetration. So we invest across that, look at different technologies, battery as well as non-battery thermal energy storage and the likes, okay? And uh, our approach is thinking about things from a system perspective of how you integrate different solutions, always picking the best in kind and find the right solution for the specific problem on the grid or on the microgrid, as, as have you, okay? Randy. Thank you. I've spent about the last decade in the stationary battery storage market, and I've been able to witness all different types of chemistries, uh, lithium ion, flow, salt base, Flash forward to today, and you're seeing so many new technologies over the last three to five years come out. I will say that Enervenue, who, who I joined about a year ago, and it started in 2020, is an exciting technology because it's actually been around for 30 years. It's not this new technology that was just developed. It's been used in NASA. It's been used in satellites on the space station. It's been run 200,000 cycles, and it's an evolution of an existing technology that was actually discovered by the professor at Stanford. Enervenue was spun out of that university, a technology where a simple mineral was changed along with some other chemistries, and that mineral is available on every major continent, which makes it very easy to produce just need investment on factories. Doesn't require clean rooms. All it requires is robots, very simple conveyor belts, stacking of anodes and cathodes. It's a steel tube. You fill it with an electrolyte, you seal it. It's nickel hydrogen. It, it's not like a fuel cell where you have an external fuel cell. The hydrogen is created inside the vessel and contained. As it discharges, it converts back to water. I'm excited to talk about it. That's great, uh, Randy. So maybe let me follow on that, uh, this nickel hydrogen. We know for transportation, for passenger car, it's dominated by lithium ion right now. It's going to be lithium ion, right? So for heavy duty trucking buses, you know, the answer is not, not clear. But for grisk energy storage, this new chemistry open up, you refer back to the nickel hydrogen. If you compare with lithium ion, what are the biggest characters and differentiate from lithium ion to make it so suitable for uh, grid scale stationary storage? There's, I would call it three, although there's, there's many more than that. One is, well, first of all, lithium ion is a great technology for the mobile market. And 
it's in such high demand. If you look at the amount of EVs that are going to be coming out over the next three years, there's not enough lithium to even support that. Stationary storage is going to get storage with lithium, which is creating this vacuum for our product, as well as other third uh, emerging technologies in this space. Lithium ion can only run about seven years. Lithium ion can run one cycle a day. How do you re make revenue with a battery? It's when it's discharging. And it can discharge four hours. And then you have to augment it or replace it after seven to 10 years. They keep making progress. It keeps getting five to seven to 10. This technology will run for 30 years, three cycles a day, and you can run it two hours or 12 hours. It's very flexible. You can fast charge it, you can slow charge it, but you can run it three times a day. Three times the value in the ecosystem for whoever's developing in the project and more importantly, whoever the off taker is. So it allows more flexibility in terms of the use cases that everyone has come to know with lithium ion in stationary storage. You're just multiplying that value chain. That's excellent. So I do want to, uh, you know, compare these uh, nickel hydrogen with lithium ion because lithium ion in transportation is dominating. So you mentioned the, the lithiums. We don't have enough lithium, right? I do want to come back to Arindam. So lithium right now, you know, from whether it's from the minerals, from the highly concentrated brine and deposit. And uh, what's the lithium problem? Because I know you guys are really invest in the lithium extraction company. Can you share with us from the lithium perspective, how do you build this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you go back a few years when, you know, EVs were still not, uh, you know, at the stage that they are at today and did not have the projection curve as you have, I think the amount of lithium the world produced was enough for uh, what was required. And uh, the way lithium is produced um, conventionally is either out of hard rock or through evaporation from brines. Um, the evaporation from brine process, getting to first production takes a long time because of the way the whole infrastructure is built out. And it's very damaging on uh, water. Generally, this is taking place in places like desert locations where there isn't a lot of fresh water available and uh, you actually end up evaporating water from the water table. Uh, so in the long run, if you have to produce large volumes of lithium from that, it's very damaging, and you're only producing about 50% of the salt that's in the brine. Um, when it comes to hard rock, uh, you actually uh, produce from hard rock. It's a faster time to market, but it's higher cost and higher carbon emissions footprint on the actual production process. Um, so two things taking place right now. On the brine lithium production side, there are technologies that are able to uh, bring out the brine, continually process the brine to take out the lithium and re-inject the brine. Therefore, the damage to the water table is being reduced. These are called direct lithium extraction. There are no commercial projects today, but there are technologies that are fairly advanced stage that will go into commercial production in the next couple of years. So we have an investment in a similar technology. We have a resource play in North America that we're looking at uh, developing using this technology, and we're quite optimistic that this can be a uh, really important change in the lithium market. One of the biggest changes that this technology brings is that it expands the market. Today, through evaporation, you can only produce from brines with between six, 800 ppm, north of six to 800 ppm of brine. Uh, whereas with this technology, you can go down as low as 150 parts per million of lithium in the concentration, which means that all of a sudden, you have larger volumes of resource base available in the world to produce lithium from, and you produce it more efficiently, you recover 90 to 95% of the lithium, you re-inject the water, environmentally a much more sustainable process. Uh, so that's on the brine side. On the hard rock side, similarly, there are technologies that are being developed. And then I think the most important thing that is being worked on right now, besides the lithium brine exploration, is battery recycling. So if I project out to 2040, uh, in 2040, in terms of supply and demand, uh, today, if we look at all the known projects that are taking place and stack them up, the production comes, there's a shortfall about two to two and a half million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent of production, which is, a, which is about, that's about 
shortfall in the total demand. And amount of produced, about 30% of that production is coming from recycling batteries, about 40% from hard rock, and another 30% from brine. So that's kind of the breakdown in 2040 if we look at it. So this is where the shortfall is coming from. So some of these technologies need, need to get to the point where they can be efficient, they can be profitable, they can be economically sustainable in the regions where these are taking place. And at the same time, battery recycling needs to shape up and come to market in a, in a big way. So all of these things need to take place to be able to produce the lithium required for that 300 uh, terawatt hour. Well, that's amazing. I think this is absolutely needed. Uh, extracting the uh, valuable lithium or nickel or cobalt or something else from the traditional and non-traditional sources as well as the circular economy. So I do want to touch upon to both of you battery safety issue. If I look back, I say several years ago when the Samsung Note 7 catch fire and explode, right, that was five years ago roughly, five, six years ago now, I get a call from Samsung Press and asking me to serve as their safety advisor to look at what's wrong. And then that safety issue just keeps coming. In the recent years, the brisket energy storage using lithium, this number of catching fire events happening. This got to be the problem we need to solve to enable you know, globally deep penetration of using batteries for electrical transportation, for stationary storage. Uh, in that regard, any one of you want to make comment about the safety? You know, I keep telling you, U.S. Department of Energy, I say we need to set up a safety, battery safety program. Let's work on it and solve it. So let's see what's your uh, thought on this. I, I was at a battery storage conference about three months ago, and almost 35% of the vendors were how do you control the fire? How do you suppress the fire? It's almost like the industry has accepted it's a possibility that we'll catch on fire. And what, what we have done is created a product that you could literally throw into a fire, a check valve goes off and it becomes a fire extinguisher. There's no risk of r thermal runaway. I think you're gonna see more policy around lithium ion when it comes to where these are placed on industrial buildings, commercial buildings, residential homes, and communities. And other technologies have to, have to fill that gap. You can, you can put our technology in an attic, for example. There's no limitations because of 9540A, which is a, a, uh, a, a very hard fire certification to, to pass. Yeah, I'll win them. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably one of the most critical problems that needs to be solved. So, I mean, when you look at the automotive sector, I think the automotive sector has really focused on this. And, you know, they've kind of developed the, the car around it with the with, with systems to kind of manage this problem with a lot of monitoring, etc. When you come to the stationary storage sector, uh, this has been done. But the most recent battery fire was only a month ago, September, uh, PG&E in California. And, and it was up the street from the conference I was at. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, we're not talking about something that happened one year or two years or five years ago, and people have worked on it, and therefore there haven't been any incidents in the last year or so. No, it was a month ago, literally. So, um, when you go to stationary storage applications, the kind of places we're going to be putting these batteries into the kind of places, if you really want to have it in residential areas, in industrial settings, in you know, commercial settings, etc., then uh, the level of safety, I mean, you can't afford to have one incident in even 10 years, really, because the consequences of that can be quite, quite sincere, so uh, severe. So if you can really eliminate the safety problems by going into, uh, you know, non-lithium-ion alternative electrochemistries that are inherently safe. Safety is inherent in the chemistry itself. That is definitely the best pathway, no question. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to do a little bit of polling from the audience right here. When you buy a battery car or install something with the battery, I mean, you consider this price, the safety, you consider the range of your car, that's energy density, that's the parameters, right? Um, 
And how many of you say uh, put the safety as the number one consideration? If that's your number one consideration, please raise your hand. I'll see how many people will think safety might be number one. Well, there's uh, quite a number. Not everybody yet agree with, <laughs> with the three of us yet. <laughs> I will put safety as number one if it's installed in my house. So I've been driving an electric car for six years now, but I have not bought the... Uh, the Tesla Powerwall yet, so uh, I think I really don't want to, I was sleeping right there, my house catching fire, that damaging will be too big, so I really in, you know, in, right, want to emphasize the safety. So um, now let, let's continue the discussion for the batteries case. And if you look at current lithium ion, seven years, 10 years lifetime roughly, after that you see quite a bit of decay capacity. Indeed, using your cell phone, Everybody has experience. Do you feel like your battery after you use the phone for three years? Maybe most of you don't use it for three years. Every year you change the phone. I, I did. I did use it for three years. Uh, I can feel the capacity fade. Uh, you can feel that right away already. So in terms of lifetime of the batteries, uh, can we really make uh, immortal batteries never die, right? So what I mean is, if it's not seven years, 10 years, what about 30 years, 40 years? How does that change the equation of the whole economy uh, for using batteries? I think that's why you see such a huge market forecast. If you look at the last 10 years, the growth has been relatively small in comparison to what the next 10 years looks like in terms of growth. Because these other technologies that are coming out that will last longer. It's opening up more value and more use cases. Even existing use cases are now being looked at to run two cycles a day or three cycles a day. If you have a, a solar plant and you're doing renewable um, shifting or you want to do a spot market in the afternoon, you can use that asset to do two things. With lithium ion, that asset would degrade very quick. It degrades very quickly. It fades. You can only run it between 30 and 70% state of charge. Once it hits 65%, it falls off a cliff. This technology that we're talking about can run for 30,000 cycles and will still have 88% capacity left. And you can run it from a 0% state of charge to 100% state of charge at constant power. There's no cliff. If you run it one cycle a day, in theory, it will run for 90 years. Remember, this was in space. You can't send maintenance people up there. You set, you place, and you forget. You get much more value from a product when you have that kind of durability and you don't have to worry about augmentation or replacement after seven years. People think when they put systems in, they want it to run for 30 years. You put a new roof in, you want it to last for 30 years. You put a peaker plant in, you want it to last for 30 years. This is the same type of technology that can fill those peaker plants because it will last 30 years. Yeah. Are there any common? No, no, I, I completely agree. And, uh, and I think uh, from a customer's perspective, they're starting to look at things from a total cost of ownership as well. Therefore, they're not just looking at upfront capex, but as soon as augmentation capex comes into the equation and you do a life cycle analysis on the cost, then solutions like this uh, with very long lifetimes uh, invariably come in front. Yeah. So, um, and later I do offer audience for uh, questions. Uh, maybe, uh, wh why don't we do this? Why don't you hold your question? I will give you the time to ask in a little bit. How is that? Um, so, uh, let's go probe this deeper, right, um, the, the, in the battery space. Uh, you see, we talk about transportation. We talk about stationary for the grid, integrated solar and wind. And both of you are in the forefront and engaging customers, working with industry. So you, you open up your mind even more. You say, well, what are the applications batteries can enable? If you can do this in the battery technology, whether it's safety or the cycle life or the cost, and in addition to transportation, and integrated with electrical grid, what else can you work on and that can enable sustainable society even more so? 
I would say the biggest use case that has come in is because of the EV market at homes. Utilities are facing a big problem in terms of having a morning peak, an evening peak that goes from three to seven. Now they're forecasting a third peak at midnight when everybody plugs in their electric vehicle to charge it. They're not gonna be able to uh, do an investment on the transmission and distribution infrastructure fast enough to support how fast the EV cars are coming. They are looking at owning these battery storage assets and putting them at the resident's home, at a commercial building, at an industrial building, and rate basing it and running it three cycles a day. The utilities want to own those assets and not give them up because many people are already doing this. If you look at the high net worth people, they're already investing on their own. If you look at low income people, they don't have the money to do a capital investment like that. The utilities, if they own those assets and proliferate them in all of the communities, it solves a big problem in terms of deferring infrastructure. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, Randy mentioned uh, some of these cases. Uh, I think in you know, places where you have uh, you know, base load being removed, like coal power plants being shut down, high renewable and penetration, electrification happening at the end of it uh, on, the, on the demand side, like high EV growth, for example. We're seeing all of these different use cases and especially the grid congestion that are there, right? Uh, one of the things that I'd say uh, is important besides the use cases and, and people will innovate on the use cases, we'll find more use cases as time goes. What's really important is working on the business models for these use cases because, you know, simply selling battery capacity at dollar per kilowatt hour uh, doesn't really uh, create innovative use cases. You have to incentivize, uh, you know, the manufacturers and the companies selling innovative batteries to also come with solutions that fit all these different uh, situations, right? And their kind of work between the utilities, the industrial players, the project developers with the high-tech battery companies is really important within that ecosystem to find the right business models for the right use cases to kind of stimulate that. Yeah, so um, we, we have about five minutes remaining. I do want to open up to the audience for the questions. I, there's a gentleman right here, and then right here, and then right there, and then right there. We can four, right? Let's be, uh, the, be brief. The answer should be brief, please. I think th one of the big things, and we've been working with our clients, such as Fluence, on these types of models, you can't look at it from a lithium ion perspective of four hours a day. That's where the price gets high, and you have to look at replacing it in seven. If you look at using an asset for 12 to 14 hours a day, over 30, 40 years, even if it's one cycle, you can go 40 years, and you look at the levelized total cost of ownership, of this technology, it's less than lithium ion. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would say five to seven years. 
to, re to get to the peaker plant price? I, I, th I think maybe just if I can compliment there, I think y you're seeing uh, inflection on lithium ion pricing as well. So it's a bad time to run those economics because prices is actually going up because of the supply chain issues and everything else that comes with it. However, depending on the uh, hours of storage you're looking for, I think uh, each system needs to be looked at very specifically based on the number of peaks that you have, how many hours do you need, when do you need to draw down, and there's possibly opportunities for hybrid systems as well in these cases because one of the things with batteries is batteries don't scale very well when you go to larger and larger, longer and longer hours. Not all batteries scale very well. At least that's what's in the market today. But there are other hybrid solutions that you can maybe combine with that gives you the longer duration, 18-hour, 24-hour solutions combined with a battery that gives you the four-hour you know, solution or six-hour solution that you need. And that... Uh, from energy capacity perspective, helps you bring down the dollar. Per, it, it needs to be worked on, absolutely. We, we do need to move on to the next question. I promise this gentleman first, yeah. Great question. Um, we, st we started Entervenue in 2020. We are already shipping 100 megawatt hours in that time frame. From the start of company to 100 megawatt hours, we're in the process of building a f our first plant, which is a million square feet. We have 7.4 gigawatt hours contracted already. We've been out with this value proposition and the market's seeing the value. There's no, there's no doubt about that. It's how fast can we build the manufacturing facility, not only in the US, but in Saudi Arabia, in India, in Australia, and in Asia. It's a cylinder. It's not a lithium ion cylinder, it's a big cylinder. <laughs> There's no HVAC required, no fire suppression. It's cylinders lined up on a rack, wired in serial, and a, and a BMS system that goes out to uh, your overall EMS. I do want to take, I think there's a question in the back. Yeah. I, I think I'll, I'll try to give a short answer. Maybe we can follow up afterwards. I mean, heat to power is generally, whether it's thermoelectric, organic ranking cycle, everything comes with a loss of efficiency in a big way. Uh, heat to heat, like for industrial he heat use cases, there are lots of opportunities to make use of uh, that, right? Going back to power, uh, I think in the setting, the system has to be designed accordingly. But maybe we can follow up on that just because of the time. Yeah, I know there's two more questions. However, we're running out of time, maybe follow up later, but I do want to give our panelists final 20 second, 20 second. What's the bright future, 2050, in your mind, and the, the, the batteries can enable, how does it look in the energy system? 20 second. Yeah, I, I think from my point of view, uh, if, it's, if we're talking 2050, 30 years from now, we can't just think about the battery itself, but the whole system will evolve. How we live, how we think, how we drive, uh, whether we drive, all of that will change, right? But uh, I think, you know, battery, digital technologies, uh, the way we interact, batteries interact on the grid, the whole ecosystem, all of that will change and evolve. One of the things I'm really looking forward to is charging, you know, smart charging technologies, uh, preserving battery life, uh, can really change the game in terms of how batteries are thought of today. And uh, wireless charging technologies can completely change the way we interact and we can, without stopping, we can continue to kind of evolve our uh, charging, self, uh, you know, self-charging cars or something like that. So there's a lot of things happening that will all come together, hopefully. Wendy. I would say in 10 years, I would say most of residential homes, commercial, industrial, in e economies that are mature are going to have some type of renewable 
and, and battery storage locally installed. I think the other opportunity is in these emerging markets because you can rethink and reimagine how these technologies can be applied. And Arimden was talking about it earlier. You can build a road that has a charging lane. You get off, get off the main lane, you get in the charging lane, and it charges. You can rethink the whole infrastructure. All of a sudden, you have one million assets tied together in a, in a distributed energy resource type of environment, each one individually controlling a home. But if you have a problem in a particular area, you can group those assets together and redistribute it. I think that's where the big opportunity is in terms of rethinking that whole infrastructure. I'll share with you in 30 years, 2050, I'm not retiring yet. I will be like that, uh, you know, 30,000 cycle batteries keep charging and discharge, keep working on exciting problem, just keeps going. Thank you very much for your wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you.